liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here by myself tonight. So, um, but as Liberty Larry would say, I'm back, baby. Uh, had a, a nice trip, and I'm sorry I'm so late getting this out. It's partly me being lazy, and it's partly this just being kind of a busy time of year. And I was gone for a week and a half, and my nobody does my work when I'm not there. So it's just piles up waiting for me to get back. And uh, I, I think I'm mostly caught up <laughs> at this point. But uh, anyway, been been busy. Um, and then it's just you know Christmas time and. Like, I should have recorded this last night, but instead I wrapped gifts. So, at least I don't have that to do later. Um, but, anyway, here here I am tonight. It is going to be kind of a short one, because uh, we're going to put out another episode on Christmas Eve. Um, some familiar faces and some unf- some familiar voices, I guess since this is audio, some, some familiar voices and some unfamiliar ones, or at least one unfamiliar one, um, is the plan. And hopefully we do better at that than I've done at getting this episode out. And the reason Liberty Larry isn't here is because Mrs. Liberty Larry has the plague, and I said there's a bunch of people coming down, um, so I'm not going to provide a, an obvious... Um, I'm not going to create an opportunity to introduce an infectious illness to my brother's family and my mother and the other brother's family. And, the, you know, anyway, so um, so here we are. But I had to kind of replan this because it's different when I do it by myself than it is when I have somebody to talk to. I can come in a lot looser and just kind of let the conversation go where it goes with just a few night notes when I'm, when I'm here with Liberty Larry, when I'm doing it by myself, I have to kind of set it up more like a speech. Um, I have to be at least more structured and, uh, because I don't have anybody to fill in the gaps. Um, like now when I'm going to take a sip of my whiskey. So there will be some pauses like that during the podcast. Sorry, everyone. I can't go through the whole thing without drinking. And I'm not going to mute it every time I take a drink. So um, let's start with where I've been. Uh, I went and visited uh, my cousin, his wife, in Switzerland. And uh, that was a... Well, first off, it was a super fun trip. I had a great time. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag exactly, but like Christmas time is a good time to go to that part of the world. Um, It wasn't too cold, uh, but it was very pretty. Um, There was some snow, there was some sun, there was a lot of mist and rain too, but uh, there were also Christmas markets everywhere, a bunch of lights up. Uh, They use almost entirely white lights, It's much classier looking than our Christmases with all the gaudy red, blue, and greens and Um, I had a, I had a really fantastic time and I learned a little bit about Switzerland also while I was there, primarily that they are, it is a really seems to be a truly federalist country, like what, what we were designed to be, um, with the various provinces within Switzerland maintaining quite a bit of autonomy. In fact, I was asking them uh, uh, about like... Bern is the capital of Switzerland, right? And they said, well, I mean, in that, that's where the embassies are and so forth. Uh, but the the rest of the country isn't ruled from Bern. All the provinces kind of have their own independent um, governments. And, uh, you know, there's very little central control was the impression I got. And uh, I thought, man, how nice would that be? Uh, Another thing that came up was they have, this is apparently one of the central control things, um, 
Throughout the entire country, they have quiet time on Sundays where you can be fined for being too loud. And while I resent the central government telling me how much noise I can make, like going out on the porch, like standing there over the Rhine and on a Sunday night and it in the middle of a city and it being so quiet was so nice. So I do envy that a little, even though I'm not a big fan of the legislation generally. Also, I don't know if like Ween spent some time over there and that's where they got their chocolate and cheese album title from, but the, it's, it's that's what they live on. It seems like it's like bread and chocolate and cheese and potatoes and dried meats. And I don't, I think I, I think I only saw one overweight person the whole time I was there and I'm pretty sure it was a tourist. And I, I wonder, like I kept asking how, how do they do this? Cause you know, wine is another big part of it, I guess as well. But, um, and my cousin said uh, that he wasn't sure, but they walk everywhere. Maybe, maybe that's all it is. You just walk everywhere. Our cities aren't really designed for that. Um, but those old European cities, if you've ever been in one, you know, like they're very compact, um, because they were built with like horses in mind, carts, maybe definitely not cars. And, um, so everything is kind of squeezed in together and, um, there's a high concentration of, of things. And so there was a lot of walking. I enjoyed the walking. It was very pretty, a little cold sometimes, but. Um, but you're also going up and down. And, uh, anyway, the, the point is primarily that if you ever get the opportunity, um, you should definitely go. And if, if I get the opportunity to go again, I definitely am. And it, it is, I guess it can't be a bucket list thing if you've already done it. I'm not entirely sure how that works. I never really studied the bucket list concept, but if, like, I definitely want to, at some point in my life, go back to the Lake Geneva area again. Uh, it was really nice out there. And my my cousin and his wife were telling me that um, I should try and go in the spring or summer. Like, a different season is a different experience. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll get the opportunity to do that soon. And if not, someday, someday, I'm going to do it. So... Um, before I get into a real topic, we're going to have another pause while I have another sip of my whiskey. See, Liberty Larry gets to fill in these gaps normally, and so now you get to hear how much I drink. Or not here, I guess. Anyway, so I've been trying to catch up on some podcasting. And one of my favorites is the No Agenda show. Uh, and there's, I don't know, I guess I've been bothered a little bit by they aren't seeing the Israel-Palestine conflict in the same way that that we are on this podcast. And I'm trying to figure out why that is, because they see... Um, an attack on Israel, and I see unwavering support for Israel, and I, I'm trying to figure out... Now, I don't spend a lot of time on mainstream media. That's really Liberty Larry's thing. So I, I was asking him, is there really that much um, support for the Palestinians on mainstream media? And he says, well, there's pockets of it. Uh, and And I think maybe that's the difference in why we're seeing things differently than the no agenda shows because they're, they're focused on what the media is doing and we're focused on what the government's doing. And so maybe that's why, um, we see it differently. Like I look at, uh, the government, um, there's, okay. So the, uh, boycott divest sanctions movement, not a fan of the sanctions part, never a fan of sanctions, but the boycott and divest part, I, I, I'm all aboard. Um, which is supposed to put economic pressure on Israel to um, to provide more liberty, to provide actually the basic rights to the Palestinians in the Israeli-controlled territories. 
That's the idea anyway. Um, what I see is, okay, yeah, there's some coverage of the boycott, divest, sanctions movement. Um, there's been more talk about it recently, it seems. But uh, I see that there's like 37 states that have laws against BDS uh, um, as related to Israel. Like, I, I see the government stepping in and interfering with, with private economic activity and saying, you can't not purchase from here. Um, I see uh, things like VIAB, which is the Virginia Israeli Advisory Board. Um, this is a, a state-level Israeli lobby uh, in Virginia that um, pushes uh, for Israeli business over American businesses within the state. Um, I see, you know, APAC and the various movements at, uh, you know, lobbying groups at the national level, um, at the federal level. I, so I, I see government <laughs> and I see people like, um, like Blinken get out there. Well, all right, let me get to that in a second. I, I understand why left-wing media particularly would be more amenable to the Palestinian cause because even though they have a lot of involvement in the government, which is definitely all in for Israel, their base, the, the left-wing grassroots, um, recognizes that there's a problem there. And, I, you know, I, I look at some of these younger uh, protesters, uh, you know, pro-Palestinian protesters putting up Palestinian flags and ripping down American flags. And, and I think, oh, God, I don't, I don't want to be associated with this group. Like, they don't understand what they're doing. And in a lot of ways, it reminds me of the, um, the Wall Street protests years ago. It's like, it's, it's people that, that can see that there's something's wrong, but they can't actually identify what the problem is. And so they're blaming the wrong thing, or they're going about it the wrong way. And it, it, it frustrates me to be, um, it, it takes away from a, a real um, movement for Palestinian rights to have, um, you know, th these young people that don't understand really what it's about and look at it only through this kind of Marxist oppressor oppressed lens and it's not even that they're wrong in this case but they don't understand the the history of it um and they just come off sounding like idiots um or they provoke that kind of visceral response from people on the right that the like the anti-war right um that don't want to be involved in another conflict don't want to support another war but you start tearing down American flags and there's this kind of visceral reaction saying, well, I'm, I'm opposed to that. So whatever this group is for, I'm against it. Um, and you know, we, we've tried on this podcast to, to focus on where the problem is, which is at the government level and not, I mean, I guess we still get called names, but Anyway, it, it just, it, it kind of reinforces, <laughs> um, it kind of reinforces this team sport way that politics ha seems to have moved. And, uh, and I don't think it's productive for, for them, for what they want, even though they don't understand why. Um, and it definitely seems unproductive for those of us that do understand why there should be like I, I'm certainly um, pro-Palestinian freedom, pro-Palestinian rights. Um, I mean, but the the truth is, I'm you know pro-Jewish freedom and pro-Jewish rights. It's not it's not a problem with the the people or the background or the religion or or what it is. But I'm anti-Hamas and I'm anti-Israel Israeli government you know, particularly the kind of strong right-wing Likudnik version that's there right now. 
and I just, I think that people are kind of focusing like these, these young people that just want to be out there in the streets protesting and they, they see that something's wrong, but they don't really understand it. And so they, their rhetoric around it focuses on the wrong thing. That's, I, that's what I'm trying to get at. But I understand why left wing media has some pressure from their base, from the grassroots left wing, um, not to throw all in for Israel. Um, so you get some, um, you get some kind of pro-Palestinian or even anti-Israeli uh, slant from the left-wing media. I don't think that you're getting that from Fox News. I could be wrong because I don't watch any of this, but when I asked Liberty Leary about it, he was like, oh, no, no, no. Fox News is definitely all in for Israel, no bones about it. Like, yeah, that's it. Um, and you see kind of the same thing from the Biden administration as well. Because their base, the their voters, uh, tend to be more on the side of the oppressed. And so um, they have to at least pay lip service to the the you know to the Palestinian side to appease their base. But they're saying one thing and they're doing another. Um, you know, like Blinken was out there just last week saying, yeah, you know, we're really, uh, urging the Israeli government to do everything in their power to protect civilians. And in the same speech, he's like, and we're giving the Israeli government bigger bombs. And, and so he's like talking out of both sides of his mouth. Oh, well, we want to protect civilians, but we're going to give them bigger explosions to drop in into Gaza. And so you, you see that their their rhetoric is such that they're trying to appease their base, but their actions... I mean, this is a, a pretty common problem of government, I suppose, generally, is that they're, they're saying one thing, they're doing another. Um, they're saying what they think that the people that vote for them want to hear, but they're doing whatever the hell they want. And so then we had this, what was all in the news, um, was this House hearing uh, for, with the presidents of um, Harvard, uh, UPenn, and MIT about anti-Semitism on campus, and um, you had some some clips that went viral of uh, Elise Stefanik um, kind of grilling them about whether, well, let's just play the clip real quick. Does M At MIT, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate MIT's code of conduct or rules regarding bullying and harassment, yes or no? If targeted at individuals not making public statements, Yes or no? Calling for the genocide of Jews does have, not constitute bullying and harassment? I have not heard calling for the genocide for Jews on our campus. But you've heard chants for intifada. I've heard chants, which can be anti-Semitic depending on the context, when calling for the elimination of the Jewish people. Okay, there's so many things that are absurd about this, and I, I thought about playing the part where, um, I, I can't remember which one it was, but uh, Elise is asking her, you know, is um, calling for the genocide of Jews against your harassment and bullying policy? And um, she says, well, when the rhetoric turns into action, and Elise Stefanik says, action, you mean like when, it, when they actually go from talking about genocide to acting, like to performing genocide or whatever? It just illustrates how absurd this whole thing was. And... This is, it's amazing to me that this group of people that has been on board with the idea where there's so much oppression out there and everything is harassment uh, or bullying of some kind, and we got to protect everybody from everything, where math is racist and being on time is racist, but somehow genocide doesn't meet their definition of harassment or bullying. Um, and I mean, I guess it, they keep saying if it's directed at an individual, I guess this is following the old, the old adage of, uh, if you kill one, you're a murderer. If you kill thousands, you're a king. I, I don't think that that was their intent, but that's the only way, <laughs> the only thing I can think of to justify this way of approaching it. Um, but they're kind of trapped in this weird worldview where they're not sure how to, how to approach this, but the. The important part that was illustrated there was um, when the one president said that 
that she hadn't heard calls for genocide on her campus. And Elise Stefanik replies, well, you've heard chants of intifada, right? Well, yes. Okay. So, I mean, this is a problem in and of itself. Like, intifada just means uprising. Um, and, and even the chants, you know, from the river to the sea, all Palestinians will be free or however it goes. Um, these are inherently political speech. Now, I understand people can take things in a different way and so forth, but on the face of it and the general meaning by most people that are, that are you know, chanting these things, that are calling for Antifada and, and doing the from the river to the sea chant, most of them, they're, calling, they're not calling for the genocide of Jews. They're calling for a new political order in that territory controlled by Israel. And if they're calling for a new political order, it is inherently political speech and should be protected. Um, and I'm, I'm certain that there are some people out there right now that are saying, um, are you saying that Israel doesn't have a right to exist? Well, I hate to tell you this, but yeah, that's what I'm saying. Israel doesn't have a right to exist. And it's because States don't have rights. Individuals have rights. Israel has no more right to exist than the Soviet Union, North Korea, Japan, Venezuela, Argentina, the United States of America. Like, all of these things are just political groupings. And they don't of themselves have rights. It, it doesn't make sense to... Like, the question doesn't even make sense to me. Are, are you saying that Israel doesn't have a right to exist? Yeah, the state of Israel doesn't have a right to exist. The individuals within it do. And they can organize themselves politically however it is they want, as long as they're not taking rights from others. That's the problem that we're running into here, is that one group within this political organization has a full set of rights, and another group within this political organization does not. That's where the problem lies. And... I'm I'm tired of the criticism. It's like so sophomoric, this idea that criticism of the Israeli government is somehow equated to anti-Semitism. I should be able to criticize the Israeli government as much as I want. I don't have anything against Jews. It's not anti-Semitic for me to criticize the Israeli government. I criticize, I have spent five years on this podcast criticizing the U.S. government among others, but I've spent five years, depending on who you talk to, some people think that's all I do. Um, I've spent five years, or however long it's been, six years, uh, on this podcast, criticizing the U.S. government. Nobody accuses me of being anti-American. Okay, let me take that back, because Liberty Larry did point out to me that, yeah, there are some people that accuse me of being anti-American for criticizing the U.S. government. But they shouldn't. They're wrong. I'm not anti-American. I'm actually quite patriotic. And so, similarly, criticizing the Israeli government does not make me against Jews. It makes me against the Israeli government. And criticizing Hamas doesn't make me against the Palestinians either. Nor does supporting the Palestinians make me a supporter of Hamas. The leadership and the citizens are not... Mutually inclusive, I guess, would be the term. It's, it's ridiculous to talk about things this way. Like, how, how is it that you can't ask for a new political order? Of course, they're trying to do the same thing here in this country, in the United States. Um, they're trying to make it difficult, illegal, taboo something to criticize the government and suggest that we might want a new political order. But you got to remember also that our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, says that it is our duty <laughs> to replace the government if it fails to provide the rights to the people. And so, I, I don't know. I, um, I guess that's really the point that I wanted to make about that. Uh, the other thing is that the whole the whole Zionism issue, they they talk like this is kind of a universal Jewish cause 
Zionism, but it's it's not at all. Um, there are a lot of anti-Zionist Jews, and in the the nineteen twenties when this movement really really began, um, the Orthodox Jews thought that God expelled the Jews from the Holy Land in the Babylonian exile, and it wasn't the place of any mortal to decide when the Jews would return. Um, the Reformed Jews in the 1920s uh, organized in o opposition to the small Zionist movement that existed in the 1920s. Um, they saw Zionism as idolatrous, where, uh, you know, like blood and soil replaced God, Torah, and the prophets. Um, they, there have been Jews throughout who rejected the idea that they were part of a diaspora. Judaism used to be a proselytizing religion. There are a lot of converts to Judaism. Um, the, the ethnic uh, background is actually shared by the people that live in the, that lived in Palestine, a lot of them. Um, the, you know, there was a time where the only people that were interested in Jewish blood were the anti-Semites. Um, now the, the Zionists have adopted that position that Judaism is about um, blood and descent. And I, I don't know, it's just, it's pretty ironic, I think, or just absurd. Um, the, they, they, they have taken the beliefs of the racists and adopted them for themselves. And maybe that's something like, um, you know, homosexuals taking the words gay and queer and so forth and, and applying them to themselves, uh, taking the power away or whatever. But it, it's, it's, um, I have a cat that's climbing behind me. Uh, no, oh, I got totally distracted by that. Um, oh yeah, taking the power away out of those things, but they're, they're like adopting racist ideas and it's, it's a fabrication. It's, it's not real. Um, and then accusing everybody else who says that that's a fabrication and it's not real of racism. It's clever in some ways. Um, I don't know if I have anything else to say about this tonight. I just wanted to get some content out. And like I said, um, we'll be back on Christmas Eve. Or I'll be back on Christmas Eve with a, a couple of um, guest hosts. And uh, we'll see how that one goes. Um, I, I mean, I hope I, I cleared up some of this stuff. I'm, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated with the use of racism, sexism, all those isms to, to dissuade any kind of political challenge. And, uh, and I think that that's really what's going on here. And so I, I just want to dispel that as much as possible. And you can hurl the names at me, but I know better. And, uh, you know, I'll I'll keep doing what I can to support people's rights and freedoms wherever. Yeah, that's a nice way to end, I suppose. All right. So um, again, sorry it took so long to get this out. I uh, I, I should have. We can blame me mostly um, for being kind of lazy and deciding to do other things instead of sitting down and setting all this stuff up and recording. And, uh, but I won't do that again on Christmas Eve because I've got other people coming here to record, so I'll have no choice. And so, uh, you know, if you don't hear my voice again before, uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. And uh, we'll be back in a, just a few days now. Um, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook, you can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, and or Podbean. Uh, like and share, comment, subscribe, um, leave a review. Uh, you can always email me at michael at Um I get some emails from time to time from listeners, and I love it when I do. So, uh, yeah, appreciate those who stay in touch. And 
Um, we'll be back on Christmas Eve when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Ciao. Mm-hmm.